Hello everyone, this is Frederick Holmes of Frederick Holmes & Company, Gallery of Modern and Contemporary Art in Pioneer Square in Seattle, Washington. I'd like to uh, give you a, a short and informal tour of this month's exhibition. It's a group show, basically comprised of several of the gallery's uh, favorite artists, as well as the premiering of a new painter, an artist from Guatemala whose work I just really fell in love with. His name go, he goes by Valenz. V-A-L-E-N-Z, Valenz. Uh, born in 1970 in Guatemala, born Sergio Valenzuela, but Valenz is his nom de guerre. Um, I really, really loved his work because first of all, I love his sense of color. Like many of the Latin American artists, they have this almost tropical sense of color, which is really just extraordinary. And also like many Latin American artists, you know, his work deals very much with dreamscapes and the, um, the state of dreaming and the transcendent state of dreaming and transcendent state of the um, consciousness. So he uses a lot of um, symbols. He has a particular very specific visual vocabulary that he uses as symbols and metaphors. We see in this particular piece, which is, um, which is called um, Encenario de Vida. And this is, has the swing sets and the chairs and the ladders. He also uses people on unicycles. They're all symbols for varying states of life, whether it's dreaming, whether it's contemplating, whether it's playing, whether it's striving. These are all various stages of life. This is called Casa Rojas. another one this is called uh, Entorno Azul. Here in Seattle, I know this isn't true for everyone that's probably watching this, but here in Seattle at least in the winter and early spring it can get kind of gray and drizzly and dreary. So color is really I think one of those things that we need uh, throughout, throughout the year certainly, but during the winter months when the skies are gray and the air is gray uh, rich, deep, effusive, robust color is, I think, really, really critical to our well-being. We use color, obviously, as a way of oftentimes describing our moods because it can create moods. We talk about the blues, for instance. This is another lovely piece. This is a very surreal work, and of course, his work has a lot of surrealist um, influence and this one is called Grand Salon. If you'll notice the um, overall image right in the center of course forms the profile of a man. His eyes becoming the chairs. And... This is a sculpture by um, Jane Burton. Jane has been with the gallery basically since I opened 10 years ago and she began as a sculptor and uh, that, was the, that was absolutely the exclusively what I was showing until she resumed her painting practice several years ago and to the point where now she has retired her sculptural practice and in favor of just her, not say just, but in favor of her abstract painting, which is extraordinary. Uh, her, her art hero, so to speak, is Joan Mitchell, and so a lot of her work has that very, very action-oriented uh, method that Joan Mitchell was so well known for. This is another one of her sculptures over here, too, and you'll see in the background one of the, in fact, the last monumental work of hers that's available. That's probably about seven feet high. And these are all comprised entirely out of fired clay. In fact, this, uh, the monumental work has inscribed words in it, which basically are just um, kind of stream of consciousness. Another sculptor um, that I'd like to show you. Well, let's get over here to the uh, rest of the lens paintings. This is a piece called Casa Azul. Not hard to figure out, blue house. And again, I love this interior. This is very much kind of a dreamscape interior. 
this ladder going out the window, escape. Here are the figures on the unicycles I mentioned earlier. This piece is called Nosotros en Victoria. By the way, all of uh, the paintings that are currently featured in the gallery's show or were completed between 20 and, excuse me, 2022 and 2023. This is called Nosotros y el Amor. And finally, Caserio. A lot of the, in fact, all of these basically are comprised not only of acrylic paint, of course, but um, they begin really as charcoal drawings on canvas. And with the charcoal drawing is that from, from there is where he completes the actual color and the paint. Uh, going back to what I was starting to say earlier, this is another sculptor by the name of David Gott. David is a local sculptor, regionally based, but lives over on Whidbey Island. And uh, David was the tenure apprentice with a very prominent um, public sculptor, sculptor by the name of Julie Spidell. Miss Spidell created numerous public monuments and uh, public sculptures here in the region. And he was her apprentice for 10 years. And as you can easily imagine, um, he learned quite a bit from her. This is a piece called um, Saloon, which means open sea. And it was inspired by the uh, Viking dragon boats. You can see the motion of the sail, the bow kind of rising up against the crest of the waves. Another one of David's sculptures. This is called Alta Cura. And again, going back to what I was saying earlier about his being um, the apprentice with Julie Spidell and monumental sculptures, the thing that I've always noticed about David's sculptures is that um, you can easily imagine these being scaled up to a large monumental scale and sitting in the middle of a public plaza somewhere. I mean, take Alta Cura and imagine it being 20 feet high, staring up into this huge ball made out of bronze. You know, and David's sculptures, by the way, these bronze sculptures, are fabricated bronze, they're not cast. In other words, every, the pieces are comprised basically by taking, David working with sheets of, of bronze and cutting them and shaping them and welding them and using, and using various patinas completely by hand. They're, it's really remarkable because this is not used lost wax casting. Most conventional bronze sculptures, particularly figurative pieces, are usually using a lost wax method where there's casting involved um, and, and using a, starting with a wax model and then of course a casting involved. This is all completely cut, shaped, welded, patinaed, and everything else by hand. This is some more of uh, Mary Beth Rothman's work. Mary Beth, of course, was the gallery's featured artist in June um, for the gallery's 10th anniversary been her representative on the West Coast now for most of those 10 years. And I'm very, very proud of her. This, um, this summer through November, her show at the Nassau County Museum of Art was a phenomenal show. It's still running, runs through November, as I said. And uh, it's three of her portraits are being featured in a show called Modigliani and the Modern Portrait. So in addition to uh, numerous paintings on loan at the museum uh, of Modigliani's, Amadeo Modigliani's, there are also works by Picasso and Klimt and Warhol and Soutine and, and uh, Chagall and, and you name the 20th century master and there was a there were, would have been a contemporary of Modigliani and they're 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 included including Warhol and uh, contemporaries like David Hockney, Eric Fischel, and of course our own Ms. Rothman. I love her work. There's a few more pieces that she did specifically for the gallery show, the 10th anniversary show. This is from a series of works that she did called the String Section of the Mill Creek Community Orchestra, taking these, essentially starting with these anonymous photos of figures 
and using digital photo collage, collaging all these little detailed elements into them, and recreating their biographies. Because of course these are forgotten people. These are just old forgotten photos of people that are just now anonymous. And she collages all these digital details into them. There's about 20 layers of digital collage that goes into each and every one of them. And then she gives them their names and she places them in these fictional communities, these fictional milieus of her own creation. For instance, this is Bill, Bill Gardner, Bill, excuse me, <laughs> James Hill Gardner. He plays the double bass in the string section of the Mill Creek Community Orchestra. And this would be uh, Lila Mae Marshall. She is the concert master of the uh, string section of the Mill Creek Community Orchestra. And then over here we have a favorite for a lot of visitors to the gallery. These are the Falcone twins. So I can get back far enough here for you. Again, a lot of little, little just esoteric details that she incorporates into the work from the patterns in the writing in their stockings to the kind of the blurred uh, swish of their skirts. This was just basically one photograph that she doubled. Now we see like some verbiage here in the pillar. Falcone twins, who, by the way, play the second violin and are the principal viola in the string section of the Mill Creek Community Orchestra. This is a sculpture by the Canadian artist, Kim Hennigman Bruce. Um, this is comprised entirely out of, of uh, book, paperback books, we can see here. And wax. And then the book has had a piece of nylon stretched over it. Let's uh, pass right through here, my clever little door. And this is a piece called Black Bass, done by the artist Gary Logan. Gary and his husband Jürgen recently moved to uh, Seattle from Florida. Uh, Gary has an international list of exhibitions from Sao Paulo to London to New York, um, numerous other places. He's a very, very accomplished artist. Some of his work is abstract, like we see over here. This is a piece called Wasteland. Because he also lived in Brazil for a time, he has tremendous sensitivity about the plight of the rainforest and the degradation of the Brazilian environment. But uh, Gary is also a black man and a gay black man. And so a lot of his work is also um, very influenced by you know, that role and the things that he wishes to say about it. Uh, this is a very powerful work. This is called, um, oh, this is called uh, Raw Cotton on Brown Skin. Raw Cotton on Brown Skin. This, by the way, is another one of David's, David Gott's sculptures, comprised of rosewood and again, fabricated bronze. Black Mass, the one I was, we were just looking at a moment ago, has easily always been one of my favorites. He uses these, this particular material of his own creation um, to create these, bubbles, these globes on the surface. And the black mass refers to, of course, several things. Um, like a lot of his work, there's a lot of double entendres and um, metaphors. But it ref refers, of course, oftentimes to the massing of the public demonstrations during the George Floyd demonstrations. It refers to the massing of the black community into communities. In fact, what we see here in the very top actually is he's turned those, those black uh, globes into chains. It's 
very powerful work. Over here is another work of Gary's that uh, is a, a, more or less a statement again on the environment. This is called Root, which deals with the degradation again of the uh, Brazilian rainforest and the economy as a whole due to climate change and man's impact upon the environment. And it also speaks um, in Gary's mind to um, the roots of our civilization, the roots of the, uh, the black community for that matter. And then over here is another very powerful work. This is called Live Cargo. Well, live Cargo, it doesn't take much imagination to figure out what that's about, you know, with the way that the slaves during the Atlantic slave trade were packed as literally as cargo into the ships. And so he's constructed this, which almost seems like a coffin. It's lit open. His work isn't for everyone, but it's extremely unique. This is another one of Kim Hennigman Bruce's sculptures. It's one of my favorites. This is called Winter Madonna. She uses found objects. Again, here's the book. The books for her are a metaphor for um, the education that is often held back for, from girls and women and cultures and groups where they're, not, they're treated as second-class citizens. And education, of course, is power. Some people are afraid of women having that kind of power. And as we've seen, in today's world, of course, there's a lot of people that are afraid of books in general, <laughs> if it's in conflict with what they feel is their particular ideology. Another one of David Gott's sculptures. This is called Statera. Beautiful little tabletop piece. This is an encaustic work by um, one of the country's top encaustic artists, Elise Wagner, a very good friend of mine, outstanding encaustic artist. And the thing that really distinguishes her work, I think, from just about everybody else's is that her work is predicated, um, I mean, the imagery, I should say, is predicated um, not on strictly abstract painting, but abstract painting being used as a vehicle to express her interest in varying disciplines of science. Um, whether it's meteorology or particle physics or cosmology, uh, you name it, cartography. I mean, this one, this particular work is called Periodic Life Table Number One. We see these kind of symbols, so we can't quite figure out what they are. Well, they're more or less fictional, but they do suggest something to, um, to our minds, don't they? Right behind my desk here is a beautiful little Miro. This is called Le Lazard de Plume d'Or, or it's from the Le Lazard de Plume d'Or portfolio that was done in 1967. Uh, most of that portfolio, by the way, was destroyed because Miro and his publisher, Mecht, were unhappy with the results. And so there were only a few that made their way into the market. Uh, several years later, in 1971, Miro completed another portfolio called Le Lézard de Plume d'Or with entirely different imagery. The, um, the title, Le Lézard, uh, which means the lizard with the golden feathers, was inspired by the surrealist poem of the same name. Most of Miro's work, of course, was influenced by surrealism, surrealist poetry. This is a painting by um, John Andro Avendano. John is a Latino artist from LA who now lives in Seattle. John uses collage and oil and various other mixed media to create these kind of semi-surrealist, semi abstract expressionist paintings. This one is called Bidding the Pope Goodnight. This is from the, this is from the series that he calls the um, Alchemist series. 
This is actually just simply entitled Alchemist Series number 10. Let's see if I can get that glare out of the view. Beautiful painting though. It looks like he's wearing a like a very colorful kimono. And speaking of kimonos, this is another one of John's paintings called um, A Night in Kyoto. Again, this is uh, collage and oil, oil and collage in that order, and mixed media. He uses charcoal and oil stick to really also punch up the collage. The collage portions of the painting are actually based on the actions, of the, they're reproductions of his drawings that he does that have been um, digitized, enlarged, printed on archival paper, and then integrated into the painting. Light in Kyoto. Here's another one of David Gott's sculptures. And no, those two hemispheres are not floating. They're actually welded again to the sculpture. This is called Vindaga, which means, I believe, window in um, one of the Scandinavian languages. I'm sorry, I don't remember which. Uh, here's another one of uh, John Avendano's paintings. This is called The Transcendence. This particular painting, John has, as you can see here, scored the surface of the, scored the surface, the painted surface, both vertically and horizontally. Three figures. And then the last painting of John Avendano's is, um, the new series that he did called the America Americas series, using the flag as kind of a metaphor again for um, his feelings about modern day America. He is a patriot, but at the same time, he grew up in East LA and was witness to a lot of the violence and the racism, and the poverty that is, that is, you know, pervasive, or at least was pervasive, about a lot of what he observed in that part of the country. He recognizes that the symbol of the, the American flag is just that, that it's a symbol. He also recognizes it as kind of an abstract painting. But he recognizes that the symbolism of the flag as being pretty um, ambiguous, because of course to some people it represents oppression, colonialism, um, and far-right violence even. And then to others, of course, it represents unity and love of country and justice. For those immigrants who have come to the United States, you know, it represents a new life. So it's a great painting. This particular painting is called, they're, they're all part of the America America series, but this one is called um, God Mend Thine Every Flaw, which is a quote from the song America the Beautiful, which a lot of us have always felt should have been the country's national anthem rather than the Star Spangled Banner. But that's a whole other conversation, isn't it? These, this is the last of the this, of this show. This is um, work by uh, another Seattle-based artist. This is uh, James Wilson III. James is a relatively young artist. Let me see if I can get over here away from this glare. Um, this is from a series that he has done um, called Chaos in the Presence of Madness. Oh, excuse me, Calm in the Presence of Madness. And uh, this is a very this is a beautiful painting. This is called My Brother's Keeper. James's work has a, an almost kind of graphic quality to it. It's all completely hand done. When I first saw his work, I thought maybe he was using some screen printing or something along those lines, but it's all completely hand done. And it's, it's oil, it's oil on canvas. 
but really fine detail in the way he is able to convey expression. This is one of my personal favorites. It's called Boy Who Whispers. Boy Who Whispers. And then this is a lovely work. This is called Hopeful for Brighter Days Forward. Just children laughing in the water. James uses young boys in his practice, he says, because in his mind they represent innocence and hope. And, you know, in his work he's attempting to uh, break the, the stereotype of the black male and what that's supposed to represent, that model of the black male. So, James Wilson III. That's uh, my messy desk. That's pretty much it. So thank you all very much for joining me. It's been a while since I posted anything. The next thing I'll probably be posting will be um, work on the other the artist the other art historic estate that the gallery represents. Oscar Van Young, born in 1906, died in 1991, and then of course in November will be the birthday of Walter Quirt. So thank you again for joining us and look forward to uh, hearing any comments or and more subscribers. Thank you. Bye-bye.